So I should begin uh, with an apology. I don't have any radical ideas or anything truly new uh, to share with anyone this afternoon. The only thing on my mind right now is exploring Mars. And it's not new. People make big movies about it. You probably have an image in your head already of exactly how it's going to look. People in fairly accurately designed spacesuits, enjoying orange vistas, watching the distant sun set. It's deeply ingrained. A lot of people have been trying for a long time to figure out how we're going to get there and back. And in the past, a lot of people thought, you know, oh, in the distant year 2000, we will set foot on Mars. So uh, we're a little late, but I'd like to see if we can get there. But it's hard. Uh, the task of getting to Mars is sort of like driving up a hill and coming down the other side. Only the hill is 8,600 kilometers tall. Uh, and the other side is maybe 1,800 kilometers deep. And at the bottom of that depression at the end is the, the surface of Mars. Um, quirks and complications include that there, there is no air or water or food on the hill. So you have to pack all of that with you. But the worst part is that there are no gas stations on the hill. And it is the worst part, because gas makes your car weigh more. And the more the, the vehicle weighs, the more fuel you have to put in it to push it up the hill. And this locks you into a vicious cycle where you can only escape after about 95% of the vehicle is fuel by mass. So you can imagine um, if there was a can of, since it's the afternoon, a non-alcoholic beverage. The beverage inside would weigh as much as the fuel, 95%, and then the can outside would be everything you care about, air, water, food, you, your loved ones, pets. Um, and that's the kind of ratio that you have to deal with. How do you get around this? Well, you could do it the way people have been trying to do it, with a lot of research and development to develop more fuel-efficient engines. And that's a good idea. It's something we should do. But it puts all of the cost right up front. And so everybody's been skittish for 40 or 50 years. They don't want to bite that bullet and, uh, and pay up for something that may not pan out. But there was another way that somebody came up with in 1990. A couple engineers got together. And they called it Mars Direct, where you use existing rocket technology. And you split up the launches into a few cargo and a few human beings so that you can build a lot of small rockets rather than one gigantic, you know, the Martian-style Battlestar Galactica thing with its spinning hub and uh, gym, dartboard, etc. But the real savings came in getting rid of the fuel that you use for the return journey. If you don't have to pack all of that with you on the way up, then you don't have to pack the fuel that moves that fuel, and so you escape that vicious cycle a lot earlier. And the way they get around this is to live off the land on Mars to synthesize the fuel on the ground out of the carbon dioxide of the Martian atmosphere, which is all over the place. Pretty good idea, but it takes a lot of electricity. The solution is to bring a nuclear reactor with you, um, which people aren't comfortable with yet, <laughs> even though it's quite safe. How do we get around this problem, this central engineering problem of getting to Mars and back? of having to have the electricity to make the fuel to power the ship that brings you back. You could try the research and development approach, or you could cheat. The return journey, you just skip that part. Just get rid of that last step at the end where you come back, and it'll be fine. As long as all of the launches are one way, you can just keep sending manufacturing equipment, farming equipment. If you're really unlucky, um, fertilizers, but probably things like bacterial species, um, animal embryos, things like that, things that are light, and that can then be developed using Martian resources into a sustainable colony. And that question of engineering, how you get those people back, becomes a question about personalities. Are there people out there who, if given the chance to go to Mars, wouldn't want to come back? As it turns out, there are. Uh, so far, there are 100, although I imagine there are more. There are probably two or three sitting here uh, as we speak. And there are a lot of questions, you know, after you get the question of personality. The, the quest to send people to Mars 
is often met with, you know, is it, is it sustainable? And sustainable in the sense, will you survive if you live in a closed system on the surface of Mars? A group at MIT did some simulations, and they found out that the oxygen balance is off. If you grow enough food to feed yourselves on the surface, and you don't vent any gas, then you will consume more carbon dioxide than human beings put back into the ecosystem. So you end up with the opposite problem that we have here on Earth. Too much oxygen, too little CO2. This poses a fire hazard, and it suffocates the plants. But it's a start. Too much oxygen is a much better problem to have than too little oxygen. I think if anybody had to choose, they would go for too much. <laughs> because there's a lot of fun things that you can do with excess oxygen. You can use it to run a fuel cell. Uh, you can use it to grow mushrooms. Mushrooms consume oxygen as they grow. Uh, you could use it to incinerate waste if you really wanted to. And you might ask, uh, how much is it going to cost? Good question. If it's prohibitively expensive, then you know, we can all pack up and leave. It's, uh, it's just over at that point. But the estimate from Mars One is that it will cost around $2 billion a year US. Not bad when you consider the benefits. Um, if you consider, for example, the money we already spend exploring space, that is in the tens of billions per year. Uh, the International Space Station, a place in space where people can live and work, costs about three billion a year. So it's not out of the range to suggest that we might spend two billion, or even if it was five or 10 billion a year, we would still be able to come up with that money without um, undue pressure on global society. If you look around at the way money is spent on Earth, it gets a little more embarrassing. For example, over the past 90 days, Star Wars 7 already sold $2 billion worth of tickets, and those people were pretending to be in space. <laughs> they weren't, Harrison Ford wasn't actually flying around faster than the speed of light, he was acting. <laughs> and so the question really is, are we willing to spend as much money on real space as we are willing, as we are, you know, spending on pretend space. And these are interesting questions, the economics, the technology, but they're not the questions people actually ask if you say to them, I'd like to go to Mars one way. The one question that they ask, and they ask immediately, the first thing on anyone's mind is why do you want to go? Why do you want to go? When I was a kid, mom and dad used to have a saying that they would use whenever we were unable to get something done as a society or as a species. They'd point at whatever it was. It could be eradicating a deadly disease. It could be cleaning up the Great Lakes. Any big project that required us to get organized, spend a little cash, and get it done. They'd, look, they'd point right at it, at the people who weren't doing it, and say, we can put a man on the moon, but we can't do whatever this is. And that was a very important facet of our culture. That idea that we can accomplish pretty much whatever we want within reason. And if we're not doing whatever it is, this big project, it's obvious as soon as you say, we can put a man on the moon, that we can do it, we should do it, and the only failure is a failure of organization. As soon as you said it, everybody would share your frustration instantly and everyone would know what you were talking about. It was the most efficient way to transmit an idea, maybe that I've ever seen. But having a Mars colony is not one of those things that we should do just because we can, just because we can put a man on the moon. The reason that we have to do it is because my parents haven't said we can put a man on the moon in a long time. They kind of tapered off when I was a kid. And now they are less frustrated when they see uh, large projects not being accomplished, big societal problems that just sit there getting worse. And I think that more than it's about our wish to explore, or more than it's about having a Mars colony just because it's something nice to do, uh, this is really about restoring that sense that we can and should solve large, difficult, complicated problems. 
Because the only way that we're going to survive and prosper in the long run is if we do. Thank you for your time.